Welcome, everyone. Let me, before I begin this lecture, let me clarify for, in case some people were asking, I hope the images display the fact that this is not like the securities market, right? So we're not talking about uh, financial issues here. So there, there had actually, before I had these things in the previous years, actually one guy heard that and got up and left, but. Um, <laughs> So this is about the private production of uh, legal opinions in military defense and police services. So before I jump into this, uh, someone had asked me to give reading suggestions, and I said I would put it in the PowerPoint, and I forgot to. So let me sort of, because I'll forget if I don't do it right now. So if you want to, I'm going to go through this, and it's a standalone lecture, of course, but if I whet your appetite and you want to read more on this stuff, uh, so here's a few references. So Murray Rothbard, For a New Liberty, it's a book. Hans Hoppe, The Private Production of Defense. It's a, a long essay. Um, my book, uh, Chaos Theory, it's a little pamphlet. David Friedman has a utilitarian approach, which it's, it's obviously not a natural rights approach like Rothbard gives, but if you're going to dive into anarcho-capitalism, you should know how Friedman does it. So David Friedman's book, The Machinery of Freedom. And then Bruce, if, a lot of these things are just more like theoretical, like armchair economists thinking through the logic of how this stuff would work. Bruce Benson's book, To Serve and Protect, uh, you know, he's an economist, but he works in a lot of historical stuff, too, so you can really get um, to see historical illustrations of the principles he's talking about. So those things are great places to start if you want to learn more about this. All right, so let me motivate this talk by saying I think a lot of people uh, who are in interested in Austrian economics start reading people like Murray Rothbard, they see that he, oh my gosh, this guy's an anarchist. I can remember when I was young and I got four new liberty. I was a libertarian at the time, but I was not an anarcho-capitalist. I don't even think I knew that such things existed. And I was reading it and I remember remarking to my parents like, oh my gosh, this guy wants to get of all taxes, ha ha. And I thought that was kind of funny, like what a nut job, right? Because we need taxes. But the reason, it was not of course that I you know, uh, as we all know, taxation is theft, right? Um, there's, there's some memes if you, if you <laughs> haven't gotten that drilled home. But so, so why didn't I, uh, uh, why wasn't I an anarchist at the time? It, it was because I thought, well, you need to have certain services that it would just, society would collapse, there would be rampant crime and or outside armies from neighboring states would come in and just you know run roughshod over you if you had your cute little libertarian society with no taxing and no none of these services right so that's i think the the function of, of talking about this stuff is that most people they can agree on the non-aggression principle and say something like, oh yeah it'd be nice if in practice that could happen we would like everything to be voluntary in terms of just mutual uh, agreed exchange of property titles but come on there's these cases like this where that just won't work, right? So that's uh, the, the hole that this tries to fill. It's, so I'm gonna do a lot of, let's say, utilitarian reasoning in here. For the, so I'm not gonna, for the rest of this lecture, say anything in terms about principles. I'm just gonna try to show you, using standard economic principles, what would happen, if you wanna think of this way, if we privatize these markets. So before I talk about that, let me clarify something. Some people were confused when my pamphlet Chaos Theory came out and then simultaneously I was writing articles for Lou Rockwell talking about pacifism. So I personally am a pacifist in the Christian tradition, and so some people were confusing. How can you be writing these essays about you know, private production of tanks and surface-to-air missiles when you're a pacifist? And I, I don't see why that should confuse anybody. By the same token, a libertarian can say, hey, in a free society, heroin use would not be a, a crime. You wouldn't grab people and throw them in a cage for using heroin. Oh, and by the way, I don't use heroin myself. You know, most people would not say, what kind of libertarian are you, you know? <laughs> so, if you go to pork fest, some people might say that, but here, that's not, that's not what happens. We're the middle of the rotors here. So, by the same token then, when it comes to this stuff, you and your own personal value scale could be a pacifist or somebody who says, you know, I would only use violence under the most extremely narrow circumstances, like someone is in my house, but I, w I wouldn't want there to be companies doing that systematically. That's a perfectly coherent position, and you might say, I personally would never contribute to companies that you know, had armed employees that went around doing law enforcement, but as an economist, I am going to say that I think right now, with the way consumers are and preferences, there would be uh, healthy markets in these things, just like if they legalize drugs right now, I am quite confident that next Thursday, people would be buying and selling heroin, all right? even though I personally wouldn't want to do that and I would teach my son not to do that and so on. Okay, I'm going to spend most of this lecture talking about private law, and some of you might be surprised and thinking, oh, that's nothing, the real issue is, you know, how do we keep uh, 
uh, communist China from taking over and invading us, but actually that's a pretty straightforward problem in my mind. That's just really an issue of privatization and just knowing how do markets work more effectively than status top-down regulations. If we know central planning doesn't work in general, it's not surprising to say that military defense uh, is easier for the private sector to provide. It just takes a little bit of thought as to you know, what, who, who's paying for it and that kind of thing. But once you solve that, it's not really an issue. Whereas private law, like the determination of just property titles, that is admittedly a pretty tricky problem, right? And so Ayn Rand, for example, was a very staunch advocate of what you might call the night watchman state, the limited government where, and if you read like the, the founding fathers and that kind of stuff, Thomas Paine, things like that, that nature in that tradition, it's great stuff, and a lot of these people are really bold writers and passionate about liberty, but, and they said the function of government, or even somebody like Bastiat would say the function of government is just to protect you know, property rights, and that's why, in Bastiat's view, if the government started then engaging in legalized plunder, you know, taking from some people and giving to others, that was horrific because now the state is doing that which it's supposed to be prohibiting or preventing. All right, but still, that whole train of thought, they're thinking that there is a legitimate function of government to protect property rights. And so, uh, and, and one of the arguments for that is just to say conceptually, well, there's got to be a monopoly agency defining the property rights. And then we start from there. And then, of course, yeah, we have voluntary exchanges. And if somebody tries to break the rules, this agency swoops in and punishes them. And we agree that's all that agency should be doing. And otherwise, it's you know statism. But come on, doesn't that need to be there? So... Uh, Admittedly, that is a harder conceptual problem to get around, so that's what I'm going to spend most of the time on this lecture talking about. So first, the, the way to warm this up is I want to just break you out of the habit of thinking like that. A lot of the arguments that would sound very plausible in the context of, well, surely you need this monopoly system. Put it to you this way. You might say, how could there be a rule of law if there are multiple legal systems, right? That doesn't seem to make any sense, right? How could it be that everybody's bound to the same laws if you're saying there's competition in the legal system, it, it, that seems kind of crazy. But it's, it's not crazy in other contexts. So let me just show you some everyday examples where that sort of objection would be silly, and then hopefully you can see why maybe this idea of having private uh, legal opinions and the, the development of privately produced law actually isn't a contradiction after all. So one example would be Science, right? There are certainly, there's a lot of order in science. There's a lot of rules, if you will, whether you're talking about what do we think the laws of nature are or even what are the rules of scientific procedures, right? That there's clearly ways of doing things. If you found out that some researchers fake their data and they said, whoa, what are you guys doing? You fudge the numbers of what, what your microscope reading said. And they said, well, yeah, but we really have a strong hunch that we're right and we didn't want to confuse people by putting in these erroneous readings most people would, would look askance at that. And so, but that's not really written anywhere. Like, how, how do we know that that's not the right thing to do? And so in economics, we do that all the time, right? No, we don't. Come on. Um, <laughs> Austrians don't do that. So that's, uh, that's, that's a principle that we all sort of adhere to in the community of scientists would recognize pretty strongly there would be a consensus among the scientists that if somebody's faking data and then you know sending it to peer reviewed journals and lying about what they found they would reject that even though strictly speaking for all we know their theory is right and the the established theory that they're trying to overturn is wrong nonetheless we kind of know that's not the mechanism by which we're going to let the truth filter to the surface and you know that that's not a good way to proceed so again d did anybody run experiments on that Right? Did we ever run a test and say, let's have 100 scientists over here and 100 over here, and these ones are going to submit bogus results, and these ones, and then we're going to check them 300 years from now and see which group has more accurate laws? You won't even bother going down that path. We just know at the outset that we're not going to do that. That's crazy. All right, so what I'm saying is there's order in science. There's no government agency that's in charge of physics. Right? So a lot of the arguments people use for why you need to have the government in charge of saying who owns what pieces of property would be crazy if you applied it to science. And in fact, sometimes they were applied to science. Can, can we hold the questions to the end just because we're gonna, otherwise I'm going to get off track? So, all right, so in the Soviet Union, they did try to do stuff like that, that the government did politicize science, and of course, that didn't work out very well. Now, you might say, okay, science isn't a great example because that there's objective laws of, of nature that, that scientists are trying to find if we're talking about physics and chemistry and so on, astronomy, 
the stars are doing what they're doing. And yeah, there's a certain pattern of rules we can follow to try to figure out how to predict their behavior. Whereas when we're talking about the legal system pertaining to humans, that's a little bit more conventional based on custom and, and, and convention. It's not set in stone the way uh, the laws of nature are. So even there, not necessarily. People who have a natural law framework would say, no, there, there really is a, a natural set of rules pertaining to interpersonal behavior and that private judges discover those things using reason and other uh, mechanisms. And so the analogy with physics is pretty strong. But let's say you're not a natural rights person. Okay, what about the dictionary? So certainly how language is used and what definitions mean or what, what, what words mean, what their definitions are, that also is certainly produced by humans, and that's very conventional, right? If you go read Shakespeare, that's different English than what is considered grammatically correct or what's the, the common usage today, yet you can still identify it as English, right? So there are rules of grammar, there's rules of language, there's definitions that clearly are human generated, they're not given to us by nature, but yet they evolve over time, and yet at any given moment, it is a fact of the matter in most cases to say, hey, is this sentence grammatical? You couldn't just say, oh, it's all arbitrary, there's no fact of the matter. There are some borderline cases where the expert might disagree, but there are clear-cut cases, you know, you say, hey, I done gone to the store yesterday, that's not a grammatical sentence, all right? So that sort of thing, um, whereas in some cases, like, with, do you say who or whom, and there's things where it could get a little tricky, but there are cases where clearly, yeah, that's an ungrammatical sentence, the experts would all agree, and so on, or definitions to say, what do we mean by the word up, U-P, if someone says, oh, that means going towards the floor, that's just flat out wrong. And so notice there, how, th how does that happen? So there are rules at any given moment, even though humans interacting with each other somehow create that changing, evolving set of language rules, and things like dictionaries and, and grammar style guides, what do they do? Is, does the publisher of the dictionary, do they get to define words? Not really. What they're doing is codifying what the definitions are in terms of the community's usage. If the dictionary came out and under up, it said moving towards the ground, it's not that everybody would say, holy cow, I didn't realize that. I've been going through my whole life thinking up meant going this way. No, they would say, who's the idiot that published this dictionary? If they kept doing that, that company would go out of business. And some other company would come in and publish better dictionaries that better serve their customers. And it was more profitable to make dictionaries that had definitions that conformed to the actual fact of the matter instead of them making up stuff. Okay, so even something that clearly there's a sense in which, oh, language is just whatever humans say it is, that, you know, that's true, but that doesn't mean, therefore, there's no rules pertaining to language and that experts couldn't really decide in a dispute. You know, one person says, I think this is grammatical. Someone else says, no, this isn't. The experts could be called in and render opinions on it. All right, so notice that, so that analogy with the spoken language is pretty good to solve a lot of the big picture problems about what would it mean if there was a private legal system where there's general rules that can be applied in certain cases and there's certain like test cases to, to illustrate the rule in certain hard circumstances where the experts would all agree, yep, this is how you'd use it here. And then there's going to be ambiguous cases where maybe two of those principles conflict and it's not obvious what's the grammatical thing and the experts might even disagree. So you see that kind of stuff in the law all the time. If there's a tough case where there's different principles, different legal precedents, and some judges might say, I think you know this, the defendant is, is innocent here and the other person say, or should be acquitted and the other person says, no, I think the person should be convicted, their opinions might differ. Okay, so that analogy holds well, but again, you wouldn't, be, even though they're very similar, nobody says the government has to be in charge of the English language, otherwise wouldn't be able to communicate with each other, just be anarchy. People would be going blah, 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 and everybody's using different definitions and how could anything get done? Nobody even thinks of that because that'd be so palpably absurd. And in fact, one of the arguments for why the English language is so much more robust and has been used by other people, whereas opposed to something like the French language, one of the arguments was because English was more cosmopolitan and there wasn't an attempt to control it. It just absorbs things from other languages. Whereas in France, my limited understanding is they are more protective of the, the purity of the French language and they try to control it. And so that leads to uh, a downfall. Okay, you might say, all right, well, with dictionaries and so on, okay, fine, you don't need a government in charge of that, but that's because nothing's really at stake. That with just an arbitrary convention, we all have to agree that up means this way and not that way, otherwise it serves no purpose. L words have to have a meaning to, f to serve their purpose, but 
you know, when it comes to legal titles and so on, that's, there's a lot at stake there. There's money involved or whatever. And so there, the, the niceness of how we can all agree on what's grammatical or not, that falls away because if a sentence is a grammatical or not, nothing's really at stake. But there is in the law, and that's why we need the state to be there to ensure. Well, you could apply that to something like units of measurement, that if, someone, if people sign a contract and say, oh, I promise to sell you 30 chickens in exchange for 10 ounces of copper, there might be disputes over a contract like that, but nobody is going to be able to plausibly say, oh, wait a minute, when you said 30, you thought I meant 3 times 10? No, I meant what you mean by 2. Sorry, my, I should have clarified, but, you know, that's what I meant. Nobody would even think of saying it. 30 means 30. And if somebody tried to use some weird, you know, uh, idiosyncratic usage of the term 30, everybody else would laugh at the person and at the very least would never do business with them again. All right. And by the same token, if somebody said, oh, when you said ounces, you, you meant the ounces that everybody else has in mind? No, I meant a different thing. Again, that would be laughed, I was going to say laughed out of court, right? literally. All right. So you see what I'm saying, that when it comes to something like these definitions where a lot could be at stake, nobody would bother trying to challenge a contract on this basis. So I'm saying if you get that, that we wouldn't need to worry in a free society that people wouldn't be able to sign contracts and trust that they would be fairly enforced and it would all be arbitrary, just whoever has the most guns wins, because somebody might say, I have 20 tanks, and to me, a, this is what a leader is, that that really wouldn't last, that lead, everybody would know what a leader was, regardless of how many tanks the other person had, then I'm saying just extend that. By the same token, then, if the, con, if the property titles somebody clearly built a house, you know, used materials that were clearly his rightful property, and then someone else comes along and says, no, I reject the property titles in this region, and according to my rival theory and definitions of usage, this house is mine, everybody would know that person was just making it up. So maybe he'd get away with it because he had 20 tanks, but nobody would think, well, yeah, how can we really say in a case like that? It would be crystal clear who was in the right and who was in the wrong, just like if somebody said, oh, for me, kilogram has a very special meaning, that would be absurd, <laughs> right? I, I do feel fondly about kilograms, but still. <laughs> Okay, so let's work just with a concrete example. It'll help you see it. So TV thief, I'm in my, uh, I'm, I'm pulling in, into my house. We're in a free society. It's amazing. My house is gigantic. All I do is uh, I work two hours a week and I have this huge house because that's how productive labor is without the state in the way. So I'm coming home <laughs> and, uh, and I see somebody running out of my house with a TV, all right? And then I, I go and I, I, and I see, and it runs down, and I, I just know it's the, the kid that lives down the street from me, right? Why he has to steal my TV in this free society, I don't know. Maybe he's doing it as a prank or something to dare from his friends, because he has 50 TVs himself. But <laughs> he's stealing his TV. I get into my house, and uh, I'm sure it's him. So in one sense, according to like standard libertarian theory, and again, if you read Rothbard's, also I should admit, Rothbard's book, The Ethics of Liberty, is a good one if you want to see this spelled out like in terms of the legal code. But the Four New Liberties is more about like the practicality of the markets. The Ethics of Liberty is a long discussion of what should the law be in a free society. Okay, but coming back to this, so Rothbard would say, I have the right, the moral right, to go and get my TV back. Right, that that kid aggressed against me by stealing my television said, I can go march into his house, take his TV, and in fact, take one of his TVs also, because it's like I, I'm allowed in Rothbard's theory, and this, this is controversial, I don't mean controversial like everybody's really scandalized by it, I just mean not everybody agrees with this point, but his perspective was that you are, in libertarian theory, reciprocity, you're allowed to aggress against somebody who initiated against you in the same degree. So if somebody comes up and steals your TV, and then you see him next Tuesday, you can't just go shoot him in the head because that's, <laughs> right, that, because that's a you know, disproportionate response. You did more of aggression to him than he had done to you, but technically you get to take your TV back, and then if you want, you can take his TV because that's what he did to you, right? So it's, Rothbard called it the two teeth for a tooth principle, all right? So I would have the legal right, or sorry, the, like the, the moral libertarian right to do that, let's say, if we believed in the rights theory as developed by Rothbard in that tradition, but would it be a wise thing for me to do? If the next day in broad daylight, I just walk down the street and the neighbors see me going, you know, knocking on the door and this kid opens the door and I whoosh, tackle him and go in there and, and walk out with a TV, the neighbors might say, what are you doing, Bob? Right? So that doesn't look good. It doesn't matter whether I have the right to do that. 
And so what I would want to do is, first of all, get some reputable person to come in and render an opinion on the status of the law to say, yes, this person stole Murphy's television set and owes restitution, right? So that it's not me just engaging in vigilante justice. There's some person that does it. And that, to me, that's the function of private judges in a free society, that they don't, they, they sit back and they need customers. People come to them and say, I have a dispute with one of my, you know, with somebody else in the society here. We can't resolve it ourselves. So in reality, of course, I might go confront the kid and say, give me my TV back. And you know, he's going to say, what TV are you talking about? Right? So assuming that all happened, and so I said, okay, you're, don't make me do this, but I'm going to have to call in the big guns. Right? So then I call in a judge. <laughs> He has been coming to this for several years now, and it just now occurred to me this time, oh, why don't I use the judge? I don't, I don't know why, but... Um, so anyway, uh, he comes in, so I present it to his, him, and he renders the opinion and says, yeah, with the evidence available to me. Now you could say, what if he's biased, right? I mean, I've been on the guy's show, of course. He's going to be favorable to me. So there would be, at any given time, with certain kinds of disputes, there would be judges who specialize in that area of the law. All right, so, and that's another thing to realize why would a private justice system be so much better than the state version right now? Right now, you're assigned to judges you know, who have jurisdiction or whatever over, um, over this issue, but it's possible that even both people in the case would prefer their, someone else to render the opinion. Okay, so that's how crazy it is. Uh, so there would be judges. So ideally, what would happen is it would be sort of like arbitration is now in our current society. So this stuff isn't completely science fiction. You, there are arbitrators right now that both parties agree we are going to bind ourselves by this person's decision. And if, if you haven't interacted much, that might sound crazy to you. Like, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't, wouldn't the party, uh, like if, if a couple's getting divorced, wouldn't the, the guy want to always go to the arbitrator who's always favorable to the men and wouldn't the woman want to do the opposite? Well, okay, yeah, they would, but then they can't agree on that. And so there would be a market for arbitrators who actually were fair and imbalanced and that they, you know, they would decide cases on the basis of the evidence and not because of preconceptions. And so that, what, what is the virtue that judges would have? They would be judicious, okay? If they were female judges, they'd be the fairest maidens in the land, okay? That they would be people who were known to be fair and, and reputable, not taking bribes under the table and so on and giving a fair opinion. Remember, going back to the dictionary analogy or the weights and measures, because the legal system in this society would be known, right? And the judges would come in. They wouldn't be just arbitrarily inventing stuff. It would be like if somebody wrote a sentence and said, I think this is grammatical, and the editor of the newspaper said, no, I don't think it is. And then they went to some disinterested judge to render an opinion. That's what would be happening here. So in this example, I could say to the kid and to all my neighbors, look, at here's a list of 20 people in, in our area who all specialize in uh, property crime, I'm willing to take our case to any one of them. I have my surveillance video that shows him leaving. The TV in his house has the serial number, you know, scratched off. That's kind of suspicious, isn't it? Like, because I have the receipt from Best Buy showing that's, that would have been my TV. I have all this evidence. You know, he has no good alibi, da, 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 right? So I can, I'm happy to go to any of these impartial judges who have a reputation for making fair rulings. And what if he says, no, no, I'm just going to go to my cousin. That's the only person that would look bad, all right? And so give and take, maybe I go and get the opinion given by several places or one place. And if he, the kid doesn't show up, that just looks bad to the community. And so now I have the ability, I have the law on my side. Right, barring this kid going to some other judge and presenting alternative evidence, and then that judge might say, "Oh, wait a minute! I think there was a mistake in the previous ruling because that judge didn't have access. You know, th this kid just showed me he had a plane ticket and he was in Minneapolis that day, so he couldn't have done it." Right? There could be stuff like that. Right? So there are things judges might overturn previous decisions, just like in today's world, that can happen. But assuming that doesn't happen, the presumption is going to be at this point that I'm in the right, and that kid took my television set. So again, I probably would not personally go in there and break the kid's door down and grab it, even though the legal code probably would at this point allow me to do that and the neighbors wouldn't think anything of it for various reasons uh, because, you know, the, the kid could be bigger than me. Probably not. I could probably take him. But, you know, it's <laughs> well, I'm risk averse. But in general, there would be people who would be professionals at going and retrieving stolen property. All right, that's Tom DiLorenzo, in case you can't tell in the back there. All right, I just found this thing where he was like that, so I was like, okay, he's going to come from this side. 
All right. I was looking through, in previous years it was better. I had Guido Hulsman, you guys know who he is? He was a much better law enforcement agent to come in, but he hasn't been here, so I don't know if some of you would know him. I'm looking through the roster saying, is there anybody this year that's tough? No, there really wasn't. Tom DiLorenzo was the best we could do. All right. <laughs> okay, so again, the point is there would be companies. Now, this is critical. The legal people issuing rulings, determining what does the law say in this case, are totally distinct from the enforcers, all right? And I think that's one of the problems with conventional, you know, real quick casual criticisms of the possibility of private law enforcement is people just say, oh, well, gee, one company would get really big and they'd have the most agents and stuff and they would just rule in their favor and go around. That's, that's kind of missing the point. That's, that's not how it would happen. There'd be division of labor and there'd be no reason to suppose that the people issuing the legal opinions would be working for the same company uh, as the other p people, right? The people enforcing the decisions. Those are distinct f tasks, and there's no reason to expect that they would be the same. Uh, also, so when you see that, notice there's going to be competition over here. That it's not just going to be Tom DiLorenzo's enforcement firm, and yet he occasionally cracks skulls, and then he does, you know, he goes in to get the TV back, and the kids there says, "Hey, get out of here, you jerk!" And by the way, Hamilton was awesome. And <laughs> do you know? <laughs> right? That could happen, but how many future people are going to call his agency to go retrieve a television set? Even if he's exonerated, like even if there's some principle that will know if in the pursuit of retrieving stolen property you meet resistance and the agents felt their life was in danger, they're allowed to shoot the dog and they're allowed to do, you know, all the stuff that people defend cops with today when, they, when things like that happen, even if he's exonerated in this case, future people are not going to go to his company to, to enforce a legal ruling, right? That's just bad PR. And they might even feel bad too about, you know, some people just don't like kids getting their heads cracked, right? So that kind of stuff won't have, it's bad for business to have stuff like that happen. The reason now the police get away with so much stuff is because people think, well, I can choose between allowing the police to occasionally kill people while they're bringing them into custody. And we see some of these horrific things on video, but what are we supposed to do, not have police? So they're falsely assuming the choice is between having police who are often violent and, and using unnecessary force versus having complete anarchy in the pejorative sense. And that's not the trade-off there needs to be. If the government had a monopoly on the production of food, or, or let's say restaurants, and so every restaurant was literally run by the state, and then people would get food poisoning all the time and prices would be really high and quality would be low and there wouldn't be much variety. And every time somebody was going and vomiting and people say, you know, I'm really sick of the state. They should do a better job. And somebody would say, oh, next time you're hungry, you're not going to call them? Ha, ha, ha. Right? Which is what, how people argue when it comes to the police. Right? Oh, I'd like to see what happens. It's like I was talking to Tom about this. He gave me permission to use this analogy. So he moved and had a very bad experience with his moving company, right? And so he was putting the company up, and there were people who were pushing back a little, saying, well, gee, Tom, why didn't you do some research before, whatever, just being really obnoxious, as libertarians online tend to be. But <laughs> nobody said, well, Tom, the next time you got to move all the stuff out of your house, I guess you're not going to call a moving company? <laughs> that would have been the stupidest thing to say. Of course, they meant call a different moving company. Nobody thought that this particular company and its procedures was the be-all and end-all, and you had to either accept that or not have moving companies ever. And so, again, it's the police's uh, monopoly that causes the public to argue like this. Whereas if there were competition and the Acme police agency, you know, kills Freddie Gray or whatever, then that company would go out of business. It wouldn't, people wouldn't be thinking, oh, that means that neighborhood now has no law enforcement. It would just be, no, that, that company was, had bad policies. They need to have better training or whatever the, the thing is. And they would quickly go out of business if they're constantly doing things like that that enrage the community. Okay. Would there be prisons in a free society? So here, I happen to think that over time, if we didn't have the modern state apparatus, a lot of what we consider to be uh, this cr crime that's out there, and so people are worried, oh, we need the state to protect us, and I want there to be prisons and police, because I walk down the street and I'm afraid, and look at all these, ho these homicides and muggings. I think a lot of that is caused by the existence of the state. So obvious example is the drug war. If they got rid of the drug war, a lot of conventional other crimes would, I think, go down. But beyond that, just minimum wage laws, right? There's a lot of teenagers who 
ought to be in productive work and instead they can't get a job because of the minimum wage and they go to, uh, they're mandated to go to a government school where they're not learning anything or they might even be attacked by gang members depending on how bad the area is. So a lot of things like that, and you know, I know I sound like a granola-eating left winger, but I think there's a lot of these so-called root causes of crime that would be taken away if you had a genuinely free society. So it's not, as with other areas, it's not just that, oh, the state's not helping on this one issue when it tries to reduce crime. The state, through all of its various policies, actively exacerbates that very thing, and then it comes in to save us. So... I do think that a, a lot of what we think right now, oh, we need to have all these prisons to lock up all these violent people, I think a lot of that would disappear on its own if you got rid of the state and all the other stuff it does. Beyond that, I am also very open to the argument that prison itself, or at least the way it's run right now in the current system, ultimately causes more crime or at least causes more like hardcore crime, let's say. that What happens now is some people get arrested like on a minor drug offense or something, they go to prison where they're thrown in with like hardcore criminals and horrible things might happen to them while they're in there. Or they might think they might hear stories about, yeah, you know what happened to that guy down, you know, down there in that cell block down there. You better join a gang in here to protect yourself. Right. So just the mentality of what happens in prison and, and you come out of there, it's not like, OK, now I learned my lesson and I've been reformed and I'm going to be a productive member of society. A lot of times what happened to you while you were in prison screws you up even further. And that's why rates of recidivism are so high. So again, if you're doing a blanket choice between saying, are we going to have this huge prison system or not, and just have like monetary fines, if I had to choose, I would say just go with the fines. But I don't get to make that choice in a free society. I think people would uh, be concerned about certain types of violent criminals. And so I think there would be, certainly in the beginning, you could say, well, what if we switch to Rothbardian anarchism tomorrow? Well, they probably wouldn't do it on a weekend. Let's say Monday. Then... <laughs> Right. So let's say they do it next week. All that stuff that I said about the root causes of crime and whatever, kids not having skills, not having job experience, making money from being drug dealers where violence is, is rewarded and that kind of stuff, that wouldn't all go away instantly. So you could say it might take time to transition to a, a society where you really don't need a lot of prison space because that's just so unheard of. But nonetheless, what happens if you're in a society where there are a lot of people who don't obey property rights? Like, let's assume the property rights are understood generally, but there's people walking around with guns and whatever that just don't care. All right, so how uh, would that work? I, this is my own uh, vision here, so I'm, I'm not, up till now, I think I've been summarizing a lot of it, distilling what is pretty standard stuff. But here, this is something that is, is more just what I've been talking about on this topic. I think there would be prisons, but they would be like hotels or, or, or oases of, of refuge. And so the idea is, because the problem is to say, at what point as libertarians are we allowed to just send a group of people in like a van and grab somebody and put them in there and then take them to a cage and hold them there? That's a very scary proposition to say, when are we allowed to do that to somebody? Particularly if the person didn't, you know, what if a guy's just walking around pointing guns at people but doesn't actually shoot him yet. Like, what, what can we do to that guy? It's not, it's not clear if you're just reasoning in terms of rights theory. But to me, I think the way we solve that is just say, look, in a free society, every plot of land, every parcel is owned by somebody, right? There's not just public land. Everything is, is owned by private owners, perhaps collectively in a sense, like it's a corporation or something. And so let's say there's somebody who is, uh, you know, we think committed a violent crime somewhere else and came over, it doesn't matter whether you know the, the procedures were correct or not. If we're pretty sure, and all the property owners are pretty sure this person's dangerous, they can say, get off my land, right? So they're not saying you have to go in a cage somewhere. They're just saying, I don't want you on my property. You have the right to do that to anybody in a truly free society. And so if the person really is a heinous criminal, or we have reason to believe that or so forth, everybody could be saying that. So you can't go into this mall, but then you can't be standing on the sidewalk and you can't go buy food at the grocery store. Nobody's going to rent you an apartment, so on and so on. So you're an outcast. And so in that kind of environment, you could imagine institutions being set up that say, hey, you know, you're uh, a convicted serial killer or whatever. You can come in here. All right. You, we'll give you reference. You can live here. We're going to search you and you're going to sign an agreement abiding by our rules and so on. But you can come live here and we have uh, employees to monitor you and things, but it's, it's a comfortable living. We don't have sadistic guards because if we did, you would go to one of our competitors, right? So these 
oases or you know they probably wouldn't call themselves prisons because that's not a nice term. They're trying to attract customers, the people that are social pariahs and that aren't welcome anywhere else. They can go there. All right, so I'm going through this really quickly. Of course, you can read uh, chaos theories where I developed this more, but. So it's like a hotel, but it's kind of like the Hotel California. You know, you might agree that, that once you go in there, you can't leave. So they, they, but they would be clear with you up front. They would say, you're agreeing to come onto our property. We're going to search you, make sure you, you, know, you don't have any weapons on you or anything. And we're going to charge you room and board. But, you know, let's say there's some guy who's an architect, but he's really violent. Like he comes home from the bar one time and sees his wife with somebody else, goes nuts, but he's got a lot of skills. It's crazy in the modern system where he would be taken and go put in a cage and make license plates or something, or go, you know, s crack rocks open. That doesn't help anybody. That doesn't reform him. That doesn't bring his wife back. Whereas they could say something like this, yeah, you're very productive, but you're not, you can't be mixing with the general population. You're, you're, you're too violent. So yeah, work here. We'll give you a workstation or whatever, and we're going to charge you $30,000 a year to, to monitor you and everything like that, but you can still work and so forth. And if the judge rule that he owed the estate of his uh, wife, you know, her, her family, a million dollars for that homicide, he can be working towards paying that off. So I think restitution would play a pretty big role in this kind of society. Whereas right now, if you go kill somebody, the, what happens is the state comes and punishes you. Literally, it's, you know, the state of New York versus, you know, John Jones or something, if, if you killed somebody in New York State. And so it's, it's very... What the victim's family gets is just knowing, oh, he's in a cage now. Phew. And that's, I mean, it's terms of keeping him off the streets, okay, but it's, it's more of a sadistic thing of the, of the government punishing somebody. So both in terms of actual justice about giving restitution to the true victims or their heirs, I think this system makes a lot more sense. Okay, running on time here, so let me speed up. What about military defense? So again... I think once you understand how could private property rights be defined and enforced uh, domestically, as it were, against just common petty criminals, if you could imagine that system being in place, then worrying about, well, what happens if there's some neighboring state that's going to roll in with tanks and bombers and stuff? How do we stop them? It's not like uh, Tom DiLorenzo's hand's going to catch the nuclear bomb. He probably could, but let's not put him up to it, right? How is that going to happen? Well, here, and this, so now I'm back to, this is pretty standard libertarian stuff, whereas, the, like I said, that my thing with prisons is more something, my own um, attempt to solve that. So now this is pretty standard. You could have insurance companies filling the gap, all right? So if you own, the people who own the skyscrapers in Manhattan, that's very valuable property. They have insurance policies in case of fire damage, right? If there's a big fire that totally ruins that building, you want to be indemnified for that. There could be hundreds of millions of dollars of losses there. The owners don't want to just roll the dice all the time. They want to have insurance in place. By the same token, if there's no state purporting to protect us with their army and navy and so forth, the people in the free society aren't stupid. They know as much as we do right now that, oh, gee, if we're really rich and productive and we have no means of defending ourselves, some state might come in and steal everything or enslave us. So what are we going to do? So I think the owners of skyscrapers would take out large insurance policies saying, if this building is seized by foreign armies or you know bombed or whatever, the insurance company indemnifies us. And the insurance company could be off-site, because some people have said, well, if the enemy takes over, then isn't the insurance company. But if it could be an insurance company in California, if New York gets invaded, that company still you know, is going to owe money to the people who might not be living in New York also. Uh, and then, okay, now that we have these big insurance policies, what does the insurance company want to do? Is it just going to sit there and say, well, I hope nobody ever invades us? No, they can take steps to reduce the chance that that will happen. So just like right now, um, if you have a good driving record, your auto insurance premiums are lower. If you uh, install uh, you know, smoke alarms and, and ex fire extinguishers and you have all kinds of things like that, your premium for fire insurance might be lower. And so by the same token, the insurance companies who are indemnify or who are on the hook saying if a foreign army comes in and takes over this city, we owe all these owners, these buildings, you know, billions of dollars. What are they going to do? They're going to do things like hire people to, you know, have service to air missiles. They're going to train some uh, troops to be able to repel invasions. They might put mines out in the water. They might have a small Navy patrolling. They might have a lot of, I bet they have a lot of surveillance. They might have um, even foreign intelligence, you know, people abroad just to try to stay abreast of developments to, you know, give a heads up, like say, hey, I think about six months from now, it's conceivable they're going to send an aircraft carrier, so you better start getting ready for that. Things like that. 
the difference is they would always be respecting property rights. Okay, and again, with the time constraints here, I can't really develop it, but that is, is a crucial element. So these companies would be respecting the property rights. So they couldn't draft massive armies, right? That's, would be, that wouldn't be possible. That wouldn't be financially feasible. They couldn't pay millions of people to have this huge standing army that would cost too much, right? They couldn't, like, let's say an invasion was coming in, if they wanted to strategically blow up some bridges to slow the invaders, they would have to compensate the bridge owners. They couldn't just blow stuff up and then say, well, hey, there's a war on, we can do what we want, it's our job to defend the region. No, they, they, that's, the, the owners of the bridges could, take, could file suit against the defense agencies and say, that was my property, and they blew it up. Right? So the defense agency might do it, like thinking we have to do it, but then they would still have to compensate the people. Right? So and you might, some status might say, oh, that's going to tie the hands of the military, Good. That's what it's supposed to, right? That's what property rights do. You don't want a firm able to expend vast resources with no check on its behavior. And it's the same thing with military defense, just like it is with apple production. You wouldn't say, well, no, apples are really important. So if they need to, the apple producers should be able to just seize large areas of farmland and plant more apple trees. That wouldn't be, no, because there's other competing values. By the same token, you don't just want the people running the defense agencies to be able to do whatever they want that you have to conserve property, uh, the scarce resources. And so in chaos theory, for example, I walk through and just show you more specifically how things might get allocated. Very quickly, I think what would happen is insurance companies would post bounties. They might say, like say you're being invaded, they might say, hey, for every enemy tank you take out, we'll pay you $20,000. Well, they wouldn't be using dollars. We'll pay you 20,000 Rothbards, right? Which is a certain... <laughs> exchange for the weight of gold, okay? And, and so then there could be mercenary groups or whatever competing. So it's not even like there would be like six big defense agencies and they would handle everything. No, there could be all kinds. There could be snipers. There could be all kinds of stuff. People just using surface-to-air missiles, doing things. But again, they would have to respect property rights. That They couldn't just blow stuff up that was their own you know, neighbor's stuff. They would be repelling the enemy invasion and maybe... So they would have to run a calculation. If they made more in bounties, then they had to compensate in case you know, there's collateral damage. Okay, okay, as long as it's profitable. So you see how that logic trickles through. And if you understand why central planning doesn't work in conventional areas, it's the same logic when it comes to military defense. That central planners, we've got a certain amount of snipers at our disposal, service-to-air missiles, tanks. Should we have more tanks and fewer planes or vice versa? Who knows? That's like saying, you know, should the Soviet Union have had more coal production and, and less diapers being produced. You, that's not a question you can answer technologically. You need to have market prices to answer it. By the same token, should we put more of our defense into snipers or more into putting landmines down for the tanks that are coming in? We don't know that a priori. You can't just ask a bunch of military experts. You would need market prices generated by insurance companies running calculations saying how valuable are these buildings and so on. All right? So that's how I've just given you a taste of how you would bring in market forces that we know work so well in other contexts into something like this. All right, I got just a few minutes here. Of course, I'll stick around for questions after. Let me just run through some common objections. Wouldn't the mafia become the government? So, number one, the mafia is way cooler than the government. All right, so, and I mean, so yeah, they are cooler, but also they're much better behaved, right? You go watch the Godfather. Yeah, they're ruthless, but they don't go and just start taking money from thousands of people and then insult them by saying, we're doing this as a favor to you, right? I mean, and people know when they get crossed by them that, you know, that they, you could largely avoid dealing with the mafia. I'll put it to you that way. I'm not in every single case. I'm not saying they were purely voluntary. Of course not. But the point is that if, if, that were the, if that's the argument, all I could just say is that would be better than what we have now. End of story, right? You'd have to make an argument, no, the mafia would turn into the government, which again is silly. It's saying, well, no, the mafia would just turn to the government right now, and we admit that the government right now is worse than the mafia, and so let's just keep the government right now. That doesn't make any sense. At least let's have the mafia and have it be cool for 10 years before they turn into the current <laughs> government. Beyond that, though, all the areas where the mafia specializes in right now are heavily regulated by the state. What's the mafia in? Like prostitution, drugs, gambling, things like that. So all areas that are heavily regulated by the state. When you have free and open competition... Reputable business people rise to the top, not gangsters, okay? So th this, it's not just that this misses the mark, it's exactly wrong. The reason the mafia has as much power as it has right now is because of the state. Okay, let me just do this last one. Um, wouldn't warlords take over? Walter Block, I have an essay at Mises.org with this title. 
The best thing about it is that picture, but my words aren't bad either. Walter Block, Walter Block says that he thinks this is one of the best libertarian essays ever written or something like that. Um, maybe it's the best libertarian essays ever written by Bob Murphy. That, that's what he said. <laughs> um, so here, let me just make the point very quickly, the last point here. My argument was to say, look, I'm not guaranteeing you that if we stay at a free society and had these institutions in place like I just sketched for you, that a thousand years from now, they're still going to be free. Of course, the people might just become corrupt. They might be, all become status internally. They might get conquered by some outside force. The argument is always one of other things equal. A free society is more likely to repel foreigners than a status society, right? It's, people say, oh, how could you repel Nazi Germany? Well, France didn't repel Nazi Germany either. Nobody ever points to that and says, oh, I guess statism doesn't work when it comes to defense. Right, even though that's an example of a status country failing to defend itself. So that's not the issue. The issue is just how do you best mobilize your resources? And so with this, the, the type of population that would need to exist so that these competing institutions would fail to keep it safe, if you had democratic elections, they would elect statists, right? So it's not that you solve this problem by having a government in place. You just make it that much worse. So yeah, the people might not keep their freedom. They might lose it and become enslaved to a tyrant. But at least if you start out with the guns distributed among 100 agencies, it would, there has to be consolidation. If instead you take all the guns and give it to one agency and say, now we're going to have an election, you better behave yourself or else we're going to be really upset. You know, we're going to vote really hard next time. <laughs> you know, it's, that, that's not as big a check as having the guns distributed a bunch of competing agencies. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>